Welcome to Three Chords in the Truth, where today I will be talking with Austin's very own Bill Carter about his debut album, Stomping Grounds, that came out in 1985. In this episode, I'll be talking with Bill about this album and some stories behind some of the songs, about his love of country music and where it all began, a time he spent with Keith Richards bonding over their love of Merle Haggard, about the very first day that he wound up here in Austin, and where you can go see Bill playing today. Thank you for tuning in to Three Chords and the Truth, and enjoy this episode with Bill Carter. My first record, Stomping Grounds, um, I called it that because I was, uh, I grew up in Washington State, is where I went to like junior high and high school. I didn't go to high school, that only lasted a month. but. Uh, because they decided I shouldn't go to high school anymore, so I didn't. But um, but yeah, we we had we used to we had a we had a place there called Stomping Grounds where we'd go and you know drink, you know have keg parties and stuff like that. But um, so it was around it was west it was on the Olympic Peninsula west of Seattle, around a town called Bremerton, Washington. That's pretty much where I grew up. I wasn't born there. But I grew up there. Yeah, the record Stomping Grounds was made in Cedar Creek Studio in South Austin. I think it's still there, I'm not sure. But it was a great studio. But um, I don't, that, that record, I'd, I'd never made a record before. It was the first record I made, and I always wrote songs, and I'd written some songs before that. Yeah, that, that, uh, that I wrote. Well, Willie the Wimp's on there, and that was. And so, I don't know how I knew Jim. I didn't know Jimmy. I was working with this production company, and I said, man, I, I, we're going to make this record. And I said, well, I, I think it'd be great if that guy, Jimmy Vaughn, he's in a group called the Fabulous Thunderbirds, if he played guitar. So they set that up. And so Jimmy and I met the first day that we were recording. I just walked in, and we met and said, hey, uh, here's the songs I'm going to do. I just knew he'd be the right guy to play on this stuff, because it's real kind of rocket billy, kind of stripped down, just basic three chord rock and roll stuff. So, uh, so I knew he'd be the guy. But 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 I had just written a bunch of songs, and and I think it was I can't remember if it was after that or before that that I had written. Why well, get up? That the Thunderbirds did, but I knew it had to be after because I did, hadn't I never met Jimmy until his first record. So I don't he, yeah. So we just we you know just went in and here's the songs I just played through them, and then the guys would play. You know, it was just it was just Jimmy and. Uh, a bass player named Roscoe Beck and a drummer named Steve Metter. They were in a group called Passenger, kind of a kind of a jazz rock sort of thing. Just wanted two guys that could just really play good time and straight. So they didn't really play what they what they actually do, you know, the kind of music they do. But anyway, just needed them to keep good time. It's hard to find sometimes. But anyway, so so we just went in there and recorded it, and I, I don't know, maybe one day, maybe two days, you know, because there's only I don't know how many songs are on here, ten or so. Yeah, so probably recorded them all in one day or maybe two. Just ran it down, and that was it, you know. The record never came out or anything. It just they pressed some copies and cassettes and LPs, and that was it. But it was never out, it was never in stores, it was never available until a European label picked it up in Germany, and then they made it more available. With the original cover. That's the original cover, I mean, that's the original cover. And then the other cover is me in front of this 57 Cadillac. That was a different cover for the German version of the record. It was a fun record to make. I mean, I really enjoyed it, I, that was, it was really fun. Well, I never had any intentions of ever making a record. You know, when I did make Stomping Grounds, I I was with a production company at the time called Free Flow Productions in Austin, and they and, and the roster at that time was Joe Ely and Jerry Jeff Walker and Carol King and me and Christopher Cross. So I was just a songwriter. I mean, 
Yeah, even before that record, I'd, we'd recorded a bunch of like real screaming. I'd done a bunch of stuff, sort of like almost like ACDC kind of stuff that I was writing. And um, so it was pretty cool to just have a record. I mean, they did. They they said, "Hey, you ought to make a record." And I went, "Oh, all right." You know, so I wrote those kind of songs to make that kind of record. I don't know why I just did. It was just what I was feeling at the time, I guess. You know. I never had any intent. I never have any intention of doing anything, a plan. You know, it just comes the way it does. Kind of like this, you know. It's like <laughs> Mrs. Jones. This song on that record is just a fictional character. You know, like a like a lot of the stuff on this record is just kind of stuff I envision the different people you know uh, other than Willie the Wimp who was a really a, a real person that you know the rest of the, like any kind of characters on there were just you know just just something I thought about some chick that was older that used to be hip you know back when and still you know kind of has the same sort of feel for music and stuff but just you're older and so it's different Yeah, the interesting thing about Willie the Wimp, which is a true story about a Chicago pimp drug dealer, south side of Chicago. That was an article I read, a, Bob, a guy named Bob Green, writer for the Chicago, I think it's Tribune, Chicago something, I think Tribune. But I read that article, it was in, it was in the Austin paper, it was just a, uh, uh, whatever you call it, they just supplement, is that what they call them? When it just comes from another paper. Anyway, but I'd read that the morning I was going to make this record and I wrote the song on the way to the studio. I, Ruth and I wrote it and I was saying, man, this is cool, and check this out, and we read it. And I said, we ought to write a song. So we just started writing down, just most of the song came from the article. A lot of the lyrics did. I mean, we had to make it all rhyme, and there was a lot of other stuff you had to do, but so wrote it on the way to the uh, studio, and, and, you know, of course, played it for, Jimmy loved it immediately, but, um, but yeah, that song was, was strange, because, and then Stevie recorded the song, and, and it was out, and pretty popular, you know, because everything Stevie did was, it was on that live album, uh, Live Alive, is that what that was called? Yeah, did it at the Opry House, I think it was. Well, I got a call one day from a guy in, uh, uh, I think it was Jackson, Mississippi, and he called and Bill Carter, and I, I said, well, I don't know who's this, and he says, oh, it's Detective somebody, I forget the guy's name. He's a detective from Jackson, Mississippi, and I went, well, you know, it was a strange call to get. And I, so he, he went on to tell, ask me if I was the guy that wrote this song called Willie the Wimp in his Cadillac Coffin. And I said, uh, yeah, my wife and I wrote that song. And I said, why do you ask? I mean, I was, it was really making me a little nervous because he was, said he was a detective. He said, well, there was an incident here and that song came up. And I said, oh, really? I said, that's, that's odd. I said, what, what came up? He goes, well, I really, you know, I, I'm, he said he wasn't really at liberty to tell me. And I said, well, you know, I actually talked him into it. You know, I said, you know, I, I, it's my song. You know, you, you, you call me, you tell me it's involved somehow. I said, I should know, shouldn't I? I mean, just in case or whatever. And he goes, well, okay, I'll tell you. He said, I, uh, I talked to the guy a long time but he, before we actually got to the story. He said that there was a homicide in Jackson, Mississippi. And, uh, and they found this guy in a Cadillac, dead. And he had the lyrics to my song, our song, like on his chest with a knife stuck in his heart. And uh, so, that was a, you know, I mean, you, you know, you never know where your songs are gonna wind up. I mean, I've had the lyrics on headstones, some of my lyrics, but, it, but at any rate, I, I told Stevie the story and, and it freaked him out. He never played it again. He never played the song again. He thought that maybe he, you know, somehow it wasn't a, I, I don't know. It just kind of spooked him, I think. I, uh, however, thought that it was, uh, 
I thought it was. I, I, I bet you no one else has ever had their song in a place like that. <laughs> I thought, you know. So I dug it. I'm sorry somebody got murdered, but they had to. May as well have my lyrics involved in it. I don't know. But anyway, yeah, that's a that's a that's an interesting. I mean, to me, that's an interesting story. I mean, just because you know, you don't hear about that. I don't know if I've ever heard anything like that with a song. You know, sometimes people leave notes and things and stuff, but all the lyrics, you know, to the song. My greatest accomplishment. I've always loved classic cars, you know, I've always, I've always, you know, growing up in the 60s, pretty much being a teenager, I mean, first of all, it was when all cars were really cool, and a lot of, it was a real main thing in high school and stuff to have a cool car, man, especially like a 57 Chevy or whatever, but uh, so I was always really into it, I could never afford to have one, you know, I never, because I didn't grow up with anything, you know, like that, but um, so I always really liked cars, old cars, and 50s and 60s cars, and um, so when I was writing this record, I was basically writing, you know, just just about an era, almost, you know, and about when I was that age, you know, and, uh, and then I went on to have some cars of my own, you know, that were older, uh, you know, some custom cars, and stuff like that but uh, I just always liked that kind of thing it was a real part of that growing up at that time I mean that was really a, a, a thing you know cool cars man it was a good it was a good thing to to uh, um, <clears throat> you know try and achieve you know and a lot of guys did you know worked at gas station you know there weren't many jobs or anything so guys worked at gas stations and you did all the work yourself you know and it wasn't, you didn't go take your car to have it customized or anything but I've just always been a big fan, still am, you know. Yeah, that's true. In about 1977, six or seven, I hadn't been down here very long. I was, uh, I'd been playing, when I moved here, I was a bass player playing in country bands, straight hillbilly bands, because I grew up with that kind of stuff. Still love it as much as anything. And uh, <clears throat> at that time, I was out of, uh, I was out of work. You know, I couldn't, I had some gigs around here, but not enough, and I had some songs. I was starting to write songs, you know, that I thought were better than they were. And uh, so I thought, well, I'll just go to Nashville, man. Right, have some songs recorded by people, which didn't work out. So I hitchhiked out to Nashville with my bass guitar. And um, oddly enough, I, I, I had a, a, the name of a guy, a guy named, um, what was his name? I forget, it doesn't matter, but he was at the time, managing um tracy nelson gal tracy nelson mother earth i think was the name of the group and this guy was also one time the boyfriend for a while of janice joplin but um i, forget, I can't i'll think of his name in a minute but uh so i kind of had his name and address through some other people so maybe he could find me something some kind of gig and i went to see him and he said that, um, he said, yeah, I got this guy, Johnny Barnett, not Burnett, Barnett, not the same. He, he uh, he's a songwriter and he's going to be here in a few days. And, you know, he has a bass player play with him sometimes. And I said, oh, cool. So that was going to be in a few days. So I didn't tell um, this guy at the time that, you know, I just, I just had my bass guitar and a little bag of some clothes. And uh, I didn't tell him I didn't have anywhere to stay. So every night I would just, he, he had a 56 Chevrolet four door, you know, and I remember, so every night I would just sneak and I'd sleep in the back seat of his car outside of his place without him even knowing. Until I finally, until a few days later when Johnny Barnett showed up and I met him and he was a real character, great songwriter. Um, and he had some gigs, and I went on and played bass with him. But we had, but one of the gigs was going up through, it was all the way up through like the east, going, and we wound up at the Lone Star Cafe in New York City. We played there. Oh no, at the time in Nashville, we also I'd also met this guy named Newman Jones, 
real character from <clears throat> Dyersburg, Tennessee. But he knew the Stones, and he and he and he traveled with them. I don't know exactly what he did. I mean, he was a guitar maker. Moved here later on, and he made these Newman guitars, these weird shaped guitars that Keith even played a few times. A couple other people had them. But anyway, I met that guy, and he said, "Yeah, man, well." When you're up in New York, man, we'll go hang out with Keith. And we thought, yeah. you know, I mean, it, we, he was just a funny guy, and we thought, cool. So anyway, we, we played at the Lone Star Cafe in New York City, and, and um, Newman met us there. He was up there. He, happened to be, he didn't go up there with us. He was just wound up there. So when we were done, he said, hey, man, um, let's go over to, uh, we're going to go over to uh, John Phillips' apartment. And Mama's and Papa's John Phillips. I said, cool. He said, yeah, Keith's over there, man. We'll go over and hang out. I said, all right. So we went over there, me and this guy, Johnny and Newman, and there's John Phillips and Keith Richards. And um, it was really funny because they had this big, for back then, however, whatever the biggest TV you could have, there was one in the room. It was an apartment. And it was just Keith and John Phillips. And uh, so we came in, we met and stuff. And, and, and as soon as we sat down, a big ad uh, for the Rolling Stones came on TV. Mick Jagger dancing all around and stuff, and Keith started laughing, was looking at him laughing. But anyways, it was just kind of, I'd just meet this guy and all of a sudden that. <laughs> but, um, so we met, and, and he, was, he was very sweet. So it was John Phillips, and, and very sweet. And we went over, they were, I think Keith was going to produce a record on John Phillips, never rehearsed, and so we all went over this rehearsal place, and just hung around a little bit, and we didn't want to hang. But he said, but yeah, come out to the house. So we had a gig in Philadelphia the next day, me and Barnett playing right at the bottom of the stairs where they filmed Rocky. You know, he runs up those stairs. But right at the bottom of that, it was me and Johnny Barnett opening for Hank Williams Jr. <laughs> it was the weirdest gig. A million people, because it was free and it was outside. But we did that gig, and then we met up with Newman again. He goes, well, let's go up to Keith's, man. He invited us out. I said, all right. So we went up to South Salem. I don't know how far it was from the city, maybe an hour or two. Went up to his house, and he was there, just him and Anita Pollenberg, who he was with at the time. Beautiful Italian Swedish actress. She passed away recently, a couple of years ago. And uh, little Marlon, Keith's son. And that's all that was there, and we, we went and we... And he was so gracious. I mean, he, he, him and Newman were pretty good friends, you know. So we watched some Monty Python. I remember it was on TV. It was great watching that kind of stuff with a guy like that that really got it, you know, about it and everything, too. It was really, really, Keith's a really funny guy. I mean, he's like a really, really intelligent, brilliant guy, but very funny. But anyway, um, so he was a hey, uh, so Newman was kind of pushing it, you know, that he was going, why don't you guys, why don't we, why don't you guys jam or something, you know? And uh, you know, Bill, you know, he'll play bass. He's got his bass out in the car and stuff. And Keith said, all right, sure. So we went out in the garage and got this little Ampeg amp. Keith and I went out there and he goes, yeah, there's some amps and shit out here. And so we grabbed an amp, brought it in. I plugged into the bass and Keith had an electric guitar plugged into it. We we. And he asked me if I knew any Merle Haggard songs, and I said, yeah, I know every one of them. He went, really? And I said, yeah, I know pretty much every Merle Haggard song. Like I said, I've been playing the hillbilly bands forever, and one of my favorite guys also. So we played Haggard songs all night, me and Keith singing Haggard songs and stuff. And, uh, and Newman, who was, <laughs> he died a couple of years too, but he, he uh, he, he had a cassette of recording this stuff, which, which he, you know, immediately lost. You know, so I had these, I think it was probably at least an hour and a half, Keith and I playing Haggard songs and all that stuff, and uh, gone. But anyway, that's what happened. My first introduction to country music was my father was from Kentucky. You know, my father's name was Cash Carter. And his grandfather, William Henry Carter, they were all from Wise County, Virginia, the same place as the Carter family. My grandfather was A.P. Carter's first cousin. <clears throat> so 
my dad, he wasn't a musician, but he loved music and he had a little, you know, this back in the 50s, little record player and he'd take it everywhere we'd go. Like we lived in Puerto Rico for two years. I remember when I was five. Now these little shacks that you could that were open, but just to be out of the sun, and they had electricity, so we'd always bring a little record player and plug it in, and even at the house too. So the first music I heard, in the beginning of my life, and I always loved it was always like Bill Monroe. He had great taste. Of course, it was all great then. There weren't any bad, you know. Back that was at a time where just if you made a record, you were really good, just period. And so it was Bill Monroe and Hank Williams, Lefty Frizzell, Hank Snow, Ernest Tubb. You know, all that kind of stuff. Just great songs, great artists, you know. And that's the first stuff I ever got, went into my head. The moment I'd wake up in the morning, that'd be on the record player in a lot of cases. And uh, I thank him for that to this day, you know. Because, uh, and I only write songs mainly in the morning, and I think that's why. I think that has a lot to do with the fact that my brain or something, I was wired to that kind of thing in time. So, but yeah, all the great uh, artists, like I say, they were all great. I mean, and Johnny Cash, of course, and you know, there's so many, but all of them. But those were the main ones. He was a real, my dad was a real bluegrass fan. So Mac Wiseman, you know, but mainly Bill Monroe, Flatt and Scruggs, all that stuff. But uh, that was my first introduction until, uh, until me and my brother started listening to, of course, Little Richard and Elvis and all that stuff, which was not long after that when I was about six or seven. I was really into Little Richard and Elvis and all that kind of stuff. Uh, well, being, you know, inducted into anything, you know, that has to do with your art or your music or whatever you do is, uh, is a real honor. I mean, you know, it's nice to be recognized and appreciated for your work, you know. Um, I certainly don't ever look at anything like that as a, as being any better than anybody or any worse. I look at that as just, you know, you got recognized at a time when I'm sure there were maybe a whole lot of other people that is, have done as well, you know, as you have in a lot of ways that maybe didn't, you know, at the same time. So, you know, I appreciate it, but I hope that everybody, you know, always gets included in those kind of things that deserve it, you know, that deserve the, just the recognition. I mean, that's what I call I mean, nobody, I don't know who deserves anything, but just the recognition for, 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 you know, doing something that really, that a lot of people really enjoy, you know, really, you know, got something out of. You know, like when you go around the country, you play and people come up and talk to you about songs that of yours that really helped me through this time in my life. I was really listening to a lot of different stuff and some of your songs were involved in that. And that, that's, that's I, I think that's probably about as, 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 as great as it gets. It's when you hear that, you know, from people, from just, you know, people. <laughs> Songwriters I'd like to write a song with, wow, I mean, there's so many, and the list would be endless, really. I mean, you know, but as far as alive, right now, I mean, people like John Prine, I mean, just, in fact, I wrote a thing about him today on the internet because I was so surprised that he just got inducted to the Songwriters Hall of Fame, and I was like, he just got inducted, and I had to go look at people that were already in there, and I was like, really? These people? I mean, nothing against anybody, but John Prine should have been inducted after his first album in 70 or whenever it was. I mean, to me, as a songwriter, it doesn't get any better than John Prine. But, you know, people that are still around, I mean, I love Tom Waits is a great writer, you know? And, um, John, yeah, John, I mean, he's just one of the best. I mean, but people, you know, all the people that I always loved, you know, whether it was, you know, Lennon and McCartney or Hank Williams or, you know, Robert Johnson, you know, or whoever, I mean, how great would it be to attempt to write a song with people like that, you know, if they were around? I mean, it may never work. I mean, a lot of those people weren't like co-writers or anything. But uh, Prime writes with a lot of people. And... Uh, I would hope that one day that would maybe happen. It, it, there's a possibility of that. But, you know, who knows? 
I think guys like, I mean, I think James McMurtry is a great writer. Joe's written Joe Ely, it's great stuff. You know, Butch Hancock. Um, I don't want to forget it. I mean, there's, there's just a, a lot of them, you know, that 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 uh, have come and gone. And, and there's so many great musicians or have been and stuff. I don't know, it's hard for me to, to, to talk so much about that because I would inevitably leave somebody out, you know, and, and there's just, a, I mean, they all know who they are, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I have respect for all of them, you know, I mean, I really do, I, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's not an easy gig, you know, especially writing songs, because, you know, you don't know what people are going to like, I mean, I always get surprised by songs, you know, it's like, well, that one, people really liked that one, and I thought it was okay. I thought this is one of my best. Nobody wants, to, you know. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. But as Austin has always had just a, a, a great, you know. I mean Willie Nelson. I mean, you know, he's another guy that I'd love probably more than anything to write a song with too. But um, or have do one of my songs. I have a lot of songs that I wish Willie would do. That I wish I could I hope to play for him someday, you know, or get copies to which I can but I don't push that kind of thing on anybody a lot of people do. Billy Joe Shaver great songwriter man. I can't foresee ever writing a song with him because he's a he's a little you know he's a little left when you're going right or whatever he, he but he's a he's, he's a great I don't know Billy Joe real well but I really dig him he's a he's a he's a, just a great writer but uh there's so many you know um and, and musician-wise, you know, just all the guitar players that have come through here that are still, I mean, Gabe that plays with me is a great guitar player. You know, all the guys like David Holt, and David Grissom, and, uh, you know, I just, I'm gonna leave too many people out, so I better stop, you know, trying to think of everybody. There's a lot of them. Well, it's interesting. I. I, I I don't, it's, it's hard hearing songs and saying that you wished you would have written it. I'm always, I, I'm the kind of, I, I always, I hear a great song by somebody or whoever, and I always just to myself think, I hope someday I can write a song as good as that. But I never really wish I'd written that song because that's someone else's song, you know, and, and, and that's a song that maybe I would write one like it, but, but, but I always just wish I could write one as good as that. I say, God, that's great. I wish I could. I wish. And then people say, oh, you have, man. You know, that's all. And I go, well, you know, I'm glad you think so. But Well, the main reason I did, and, and there's basically one main reason, is that I'd, I'd just done in the last, uh, about a year, two years ago now or whatever, but I'd done a couple of ghosts, the ghosts of Anton's. Um, I had done a couple of tours with uh, John Mayall, blues uh, player, singer, songwriter, John Mayall. He's still great, man, at 85 or whatever he is. But, uh, but I was playing these shows, and they were good shows. They were, they were all like Paramount Theaters, fairly decent sized, you know, and, and really good. People didn't even know who I was or even on the bill in some cases. And then they would hear my songs, and they'd go, oh, we know the songs. And, uh, but I had no CDs with any of those songs on them, literally. So I thought, well, you know, I should just at least go in the studio one day and play those songs by myself. So I had like, hey, you got a copy of you doing that song? Like, yeah. So that's why I did it mainly. <laughs> I mean, just so I would have those songs by me on a CD because people ask for them. I write a lot of songs that are like hillbilly songs and then stuff like that Stevie did and everything in between. A lot of songwriters write kind of on the same sort of, you know, that aren't that versed in different styles. I mean, I've lived all of them and, you know, legitimately lived those things and all that. But, but I was never like a blues. I'm still not. You know, I got inspired when I moved here from the blues because I you go down to Antone's when I was on 6th Street and see Muddy Waters and, you know, whoever. All those guys were still alive. You know, and that was so great to witness, man. And I never heard, I didn't know anything about Zydeco music. 
Never heard of it. And then I'd see these guys from Louisiana playing like accordions and stuff. And I was like, wow, man, this is like, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. So, you know, got way into all of that stuff. And that's what I mean. But first coming to Austin and all of that kind of stuff happening was like, Jesus, this is like unbelievable. And cheap, cheapest place in the world to live, rent, food, all that. People wonder why guys around aren't real thrilled with the way things are here now. And, you know, you don't want to be negative about anything, but it's, 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 it's a little hard to swallow. I mean, thank God there's still places like Antones, you know, and, and uh, you know, the Continental and Seaboard, you know, some of those places, Saxon, all of it. Because, man, it's all disappearing. Huts, gone now. Used to hang out there a bunch, play down there. Everybody used to play down there. That was a cool joint for music, especially. But, uh, it's showbiz, you know. That first day was July 4th, and we drove straight out to Willie's Picnic in Gonzales. That was the first day I got to Austin, it was at Willie's Picnic. We didn't have any money, we were filthy, we slept like on the ground in the parking lot and shit. I mean, it was horrible, but it was Willie's Picnic. You know, all these cool guys were playing and shit, but that was like, you know, and everything after that was just like, fuck, Austin is so fucking cool, man. Well, we're sitting right here at Antone's, and uh, this is a place I love to play, and I do on most Wednesdays. Me and Gabe Rhodes plays guitar with me. Most Wednesdays, if there's not a road show, we play here. And uh, I, I play mainly around town, you know. I mean, just uh, at some of the hotels. I love playing at the Driscoll, just because of the history of it. That's, and I'm playing there, I'm, I'm playing there like second, you know, like Saturdays, I think it is, on a, no, Sundays. Second Sundays of the month, at least for the next couple anyway. And I love the Driscoll, you know, 1886, haunted, weird stuff's gone on there. And I like that kind of thing, you know, it has real soul to it. And one of the only places left in Austin that's been there since 1886. And, um, you know, a lot of strange things have happened there and, and it's beautiful. I mean, the inside of it, everything, it was handcrafted with the best materials, marble and all that, that could be found around here. And it's just a beautiful piece of art as well. I love the vibe there and it's, um, it's a great place to play. And I play out at some places out in the county, you know, barbecue places and some just kind of roadhouse sort of, you know, Hayes City store and slow parks, bar, but just around Austin. But this is kind of a main thing here at Antone's, you know, that, I, that I've been doing for the last couple of, well, I've been playing at Antone's for the last, you know, 30 years or so. But I mean, as far as what I'm doing now with this, the last couple of years I do this. So this is, this is a kind of a home base. And I, I'm, I'm not going out and touring it for a few reasons. I'm not leaving town at all and haven't for a while. But, uh, but I may do some more of that, you know. I like going up to the Northwest because I, you know, all my old friends are still up there, the ones that are still around. And, uh, you know, it's easy just to go up there and play some gigs and actually do okay. But uh, as far as touring goes, I don't know. You know, it's, things are just so different now. It's just not like it was. It's not better or worse, it's just different. Of all my songs, the one, I don't know, there's probably, I mean, there's a few that I would say, but they're ones that no one's ever heard. But um, I don't know, songs are strange things because you like them at certain times better than, or more so than other ones and stuff. But. Uh, I don't know, just a couple of the songs. I mean, just, I don't know, just, I guess having a song like Crossfire done by just one of the greatest artists that ever lived, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Double Trouble, you know, I mean, that's, that's like having somebody like Hendrix or somebody do one of your songs, you know? So that, that just is such a great thing in so many ways, you know, that, uh, I would have to say that that one, and not because it was such a big hit and all that stuff, but just for a, a, a number of reasons. But it's just as, as far as songs lyrically written and stuff, there's a few that no one's ever heard that are, that are my personal, that I think are songs that, were, that I wrote, I did a really good job on. Maybe someday I'll record them. I don't know. 
I got a lot of songs. I write songs all the time, but I don't record all the time. But uh, yeah, I think Crossfire, you know, I think Crossfire is probably the song that, that means the most. Universally. Well, you know, I think I would like people to remember me as somebody who uh, worked hard at what I do and always tried to do a great job, you know, whether writing or, or performing. And uh, I never fucked anybody over, man. I never, I never cheated anybody and I never lied to anybody, uh, which has happened to me millions of times in this business, doing it for as long as I've been doing it. And I can just honestly say I've never went there, never ever went there, you know, I, uh, intentionally ever did that to anybody. And a lot of people probably don't know that, but uh, it's the truth. <laughs>